الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام وسيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله اللهم أن الحق حقا ورزقنا اتباعه وأن الباطل باطلا ورزقنا اجتناب السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته on behalf of ILF, I would like to welcome you to another session from the commentary on the 40 hadith of Imam an nawi rahimullah. And alhamdulillah, with the fadl of Allah, we are now reaching the 17th hadith. This is the hadith on Ihsan. So, inshallah, without any further ado, let us begin the recitation of the hadith. An Abi Ya'la Shaddad bin Awsin radiu an. عن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم قال إن الله كتب الإحسان على كل شيء فإذا قتلتم فأحسنوا القتلة وإذا ذبحتم فأحسنوا الذبحة وليحد أحدكم شفرته وليرح ذبيحته رواه مسلم أبو يألى شداد بن أوس ودع عنه reported that the Messenger of Allah وسلم, said, Indeed, Allah has enjoyed ihsan with regards to everything. So when you kill, kill in an excellent manner. When you slaughter, slaughter in an excellent manner. So every one of you should sharpen his knife and let the slaughtered animal die comfortably. And this is narrated in Sahih Muslim. So as is our tradition, we're going to look at the narrator of this hadith, which is Abu Ya'la Shaddad bin Aus Wad'an. And this is perhaps a companion that you have not heard of before, but he was actually a special companion. And he comes from actually a special family. His father was actually a great Sahabi who accepted Islam at the hands of Musa bin Umair, who was the minister of the Prophet Sallallahu to the city of Medina, Al Munawwara Musa bin Umair, who was the deputy to the Prophet, who was Musa bin Umair, who the Prophet uh, sent to Medina. In fact, Musa bin Umair, who Musa bin Umair, who became the minister of the Prophet to Yathrib, which would later become Medina, Munawwara, and he would cause so many to enter Islam, alhamdulillah, and that opened the way for the Prophet also to do the hijrah later on. And he was, of course, Musa bin Umair, martyred in Uhud. So this companion, Abu Ya'la Shaddad bin Aus, was actually paired by the Prophet with none other than the great Uthman bin Affan after the hijrah. One hadith which was narrated by the Sahabi, which Tabarani narrates, is that where the Prophet said, What is the matter with you, O Shaddad? This is basically when his father was also martyred like Musa bin Umair at Uhud. And, O Messenger of Allah, he says, It seems to me that the world has become narrow for me. The Prophet says, Do not worry. Very soon Allah will give us victory over Sham and over Baytul Maqdis. And he said, You and your children who will follow you will be leaders amongst those people. And during the Khilaf of Umar bin Khattab, he actually was sent as a governor of Sham. He participated in the great battles that occurred there. And many from Sham also benefited, of course, from this great Sahabi. Abu Ya'la, later in his life, he settled in Bayt al-Maqdis. He actually wanted to avoid the political strife, what happened after the assassination of Uthman, and then the tension between Ali Wad'an and Muawiyah Wad'an. Anyway, he had five children, four sons and one daughter. And Shaddad was noted to be the best with the ilm and also hilm, forbearance. Having knowledge is not good enough. 
but you also have to have hilm with it so that you can optimize its efficacy. And he was also like the characteristic of the Prophet ﷺ as well. The great historian Imam Dahabi rahimullah, quotes an admonition from Shaddad bin Aus. He says, Shaddad, O oh people, the world has good within it, and that is present in front of you. Allah does not make a distinction between the sinner or the righteous person in the good of this world. Focus on the hereafter. Tomorrow your Lord will stand before you and all the good lies in Jannah, paradise. And all the evil lies in the fire of hell. Then he also said, I fear for you two things, Riya and your hidden passions. Abu Ya'ala Shaddad bin Aus narrated 50 hadith and he passed away in 85 after Hijri. Radu anhuma. Okay. So now let's go to the muqaddimah of this hadith. And this talks about, of course, Ihsan, which we have looked at before. And again, we're now seeing how all these ahadith are coming together and building upon each other. Okay. And Ihsan, as we have talked about before, it is defined as doing things sincerely, completely, in a tasteful manner and also in the best and excellent manner. And this concept, of course, is translated by many commentators and scholars as excellence. But, of course, it's much more deeper. It's a multifaceted term like, for example, taqwa. Okay? So it's not just something which is easily translated, so that's it's best just to use ihsan as ihsan. Okay? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He commands the Muslimun to practice and apply ihsan in all actions. Hence, it is wajib. يَعْنِي مَسْتَطَعْتُمْ Okay. So, to, you know, do the commandments of Allah excellently. You know, this is obviously we are doing it to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because we love Him. We cannot thank Him enough for the bounties He has given us. وَإِن تَعُدُّوا نَعْمَةُ اللَّهِ لَا تُحْسُوهَا You know, if we were to count the na'ma, even one na'ma, we would not be able to do so. In Surah Nahal, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and this is something which we hear every Jum'ah. He says, إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَأْمُرُ بِالْعَدْلِ وَالْإِحْسَانِ وَإِتَاءِ ذِي الْقُرْبَى وَيَنْهَا عَنِ الْفَحْشَاءِ وَالْمُنْكَرِ وَالْبَغِي إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَأْمُرُ بِالْعَدْلِ وَالْإِحْسَانِ وَإِتَاءِ ذِي الْقُرْبَى وَيَنْهَا عَنِ الْفَحْشَاءِ وَالْمُنْكَرِ وَالْبَغِي Verily, Allah enjoins justice and ihsan in giving help to kith and kin. So, if this matter is an act of worship, yani in ibadah, or something which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded us to do, then ihsan of it means to complete its conditions, pillars, and obligations, as well as having the correct niyyah while performing it, of course, according to the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now the word kataba in this hadith, inna Allah kataba al-ihsana ala kulli shay. Kataba here denotes, means that something which is obligation. So this is where we get this whole thing about ihsan being obligatory from this hadith. Because for example, Allah subhanahu wa says, قُطِبَ عَلَيْكُمُ الصِّيَامُ كَمَا قُطِبَ عَلَى الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّكُونَ So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded on us, Siyam, the fasting as it was commanded on those before you. Okay, so that you may have taqwa. Okay, so here, kataba kutiba. Kutiba is the passive form. But here, kataba, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded, yani prescribed or written down. Altogether, it means commandment, an obligation thing which is binding. So, other additional lessons we can get from this hadith. So this hadith contains a prime principle. Here, Rasulullah also, as we saw in previous hadith, he gives examples of how we apply this principle of ihsan. So this is of course a prophetic teaching method. Okay? And this allows the Muslim to be guided and to apply a principle to a similar situation or the like in his or her life. And we see that by providing examples, the principle can be easily understood. 
and many of the 40 hadith of this collection are like this. Okay, So there is a common tendency in people to forget the important principles. But through this hadith, the Prophet ﷺ also reminds Muslims of a practical example of ihsan yearly when doing the dabiha, the sacrifice, during Eid al-Adha. So ihsan, it's a comprehensive topic and concept and generally or altogether it is derived of four components. Okay. Number one is, of course, sincerity or khlas. Number two is completeness. Then is, of course, consisting of excellence to doing something in the best way and also being correct to do something in the, the proper way, the proper methodology according to the sunnah of the Prophet Wasallam. can be that in terms of optimal correctness. Okay. So, ihsan in our actions. Okay, what does this mean? Well, one has to pay attention to the quality of his or her actions. Okay? So when the deed, when the action, when the ibadah is performed, then it is done in an excellent manner which entails correctness, completeness, and excellence. Okay? And the one who is a muhsan, he is not just satisfied with an action that is less than high quality. He is motivated by the awareness that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prescribed Ihsan in all these, and this is why the Muhsin strives for the topmost in everything he does, whether it be big or small. In Surah Mulk, furthermore, you know the concept of Ihsan is also mentioned, and we mentioned this ayah in a few times because it's a beautiful ayah of the Quran Kareem. Okay, and this is also one of the main purposes of our creation, where Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says. الَّذِي خَلَقَ الْمَوْتَ وَالْحَيَاةَ لِيَبَلُوَكُمْ أَيُّكُمْ أَحْسَنُ عَمَلًا وَهُوَ الْعَزِيزُ الْخَفُورُ He it is who created death and life so that he may test you which of you is best in deeds. Okay. أَحْسَنُ عَمَلًا okay. So the term عَمَل mentioned in Surah Mulk Okay, implies any deed, any good deed. Ihsan is not just limited to righteous deeds, but also deeds which are lawful or halal. So when these actions and allowed deeds are performed with sincerity and ihsan, they can even be considered ibadah. So even the mubah actions, if you do it, to do it in the way of ihsan, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded you to do, things which are trivial to the normal Abdullah or Fatima, but you do it in a way to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because He has commanded Ihsan in everything. You know, even as you're slaughtering the animal to fulfill the dhabiha or in the workplace doing excellent work. Okay, because of your wanting to, to do Ihsan, it's become part of your nature. And the proper niyyah is there. Alhamdulillah, this also then becomes an ibadah. Look at how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so generous to us. So therefore, ihsan should be observed and practiced in all things we do. We maintain ourselves dressing, eating, sleeping, working, and performing da'wah, teaching and learning. We also, of course, have to enhance our relationship and keep our relationships nice and vibrant within our families, relatives, and neighbors, etc. as well. And this also goes under Ihsan as well. So again, إِنَّ اللَّهَ قَتَبَ الْإِحْسَانَ عَلَىٰ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ And the superlative form of Ahsanu is also used in Surah Mulk. Okay, so this further implies that all good actions and deeds that we do should be done in a competitive way also for seeking the pleasure of Allah. So we do everything the best way, but also we want to do it better than everyone else. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala encourages us to compete. And race to the forgiveness of your Lord. So going forward, mercy, rahmah to animals. So also from the perfection, from ihsan in doing the dhabiha, in slaughtering, we see that we don't slaughter an animal in front of the other animal because this can inflict and cause them to be very scared. I mean, think about it. Okay, so we even consider the feelings of the animal. Okay, now we that often with the sunnah to make sure that it's not thirsty, make it comfortable before its last moments in this world. And this is part of the sunnah, part of ihsan. Okay, 
And this hadith also relates the excellent way, highlights the excellent way in which Islam deals with animals. Very important. Because again, we, we've we talked about how unfortunately uh, those who are outside of Islam, the West, and often they're spoon-fed this version of Islam that this is a bloodthirsty religion. There's no rahmah anywhere. And this is completely, of course, the opposite. Okay, When we look at Islam and the beauty and what it commands us to do. You know, with every action, we have to do ihsan. If you look at how the animals are slaughtered in the West, it's like a factory. Ma'adullah. There's no mercy, there's no rahmah. But we have to, as part of the zin, fulfill that ihsan for ourselves, for a community, and also for others as well, of the haq that Islam has on everything, including the animal. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says in another hadith, which was narrated by Abu Amama al-Mu'jim al-Kabir, Man rahima dabihatan rahimahu Allahu yawm al-Qiyamah. Wa fi rawayatin man rahima walaw dabihata usfurin rahimahu Allahu yawm al-Qiyamah. Subhanallah. Okay. And this is mentioned in At-Tabarani, classified by Sahih, by the famous Al-Haythami. Here the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, Whoever shows mercy to the animal being slaughtered, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will have mercy on him on the Day of Judgment. In another narration, the Prophet says, whoever has mercy while slaughtering a bird, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also will have mercy on him on the Day of Judgment. And in another hadith, the Prophet sallallahu says, and this is narrated by Abu Huraira, بَيْنَ رَجُلٌ بِطَرِيكٍ إِشْتَدَّ عَلَيْهِ الْعَطْشِ فَوَجَدَ بِئْرًا فَنَزَلَ فِيهَا فَشَرِبْ ثُمَّ خَرَجْ فَإِذَا قَلْبٌ يَلْحَثُ يَأْكُلُ الثَّرَى مِنَ الْعَطْشِ فَقَالَ الرَّجُلُ لَكَدْ بَلَغَ هَذَا الْقَلْبَ مِنَ الْعَطْشِ مِثْلُ الَّذِي كَانَ بَلَغَ مِنِّي فَنَزَلَ الْبَئْرَ فَمَلَأَ خُفَّهُ مَاءً فَسَقَ الْقَلْبَ فَشَكَرَ اللَّهُ لَهُ فَغَفَرَ لَهُ So here the Prophet said once there was a man who was traveling the journey and the heat made him very thirsty. He went looking for water until he found a well, but because there was no bucket or rope, he had to struggle to climb down to the well to drink the water. When he came out of the well, behold, he found a thirsty dog. He said to himself, this dog is as thirsty as I was. So he went back inside the well and used his shoes to bring out some water for the dog. Allah was pleased with him and forgave his sins because of his kindness to the dog. And this is narrated in Sayyid al-Bukhari and also in Muslim, Mutafaqqan alayh. Beautiful hadith. So just this action of going and having mercy on this creature of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had mercy on him and forgave him all his sins and admitted him into Jannah. Okay. Again, just these beautiful actions with ihsan and look what happens. You know, all of our deeds perhaps can get erased. Okay. These are all just lessons for us to have excellence in all we do. And the Prophet ﷺ also warned us not to scare or frighten animals. Narrated by Abdul Rahman bin Abdullah, the Prophet ﷺ said, قَالَ كُنَّا مَعَ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمُ فِي سَفَرٍ فَانْطَلَقَ لِهَاجَتِهِ فَرَعَيْنَا خُمَّرَةً مَعَهَا فَرْخَانٍ فَأَخَذْنَا فَرْخَيْهَا فَجَاءَتِ الْخُمَّرَةُ فَجَعَلَتْ تُعَرِّشْ فَجَاءَ النَّبِيُّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمُ فَقَالَ مَنْ فَجَعَ هَذِهِ بِوَلَدِهَا رُدُّوا وَلَدَهَا إِلَيْهَا When we were on a journey with the Messenger Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم we saw humara which is a type of bird with two young ones we took the young ones the humara came and began to spread out its wings the Prophet then came and said, who has frightened this bird by taking its offspring? Then he commanded, return back her offspring. And this is in Abu Dawood and also classified Sahih by Sheikh Al-Abani. Furthermore, we cannot be cruel to animals as this is a major sin. The Prophet ﷺ said, فَلَا هِيَ أَطْعَمَتْهَا وَلَا هِيَ أَرْسَلَتْهَا تُرَمِّمُ مِنْ خَشَاشِ الْعَرْضِ حَتَّى مَاتَتْ حَزْلًا 
a woman entered the hellfire because of a cat which she had tied, and thus it could not eat, and she did not let it free, so that it could devour the food of the earth until it died. And this is in Sahih Muslim and also related in Bukhari Mutafakkar alayhi. Look at that. Because of killing a cat, entered the hellfire, Jahannam. So we have to be merciful and not be devoid of mercy, like this woman, for example. Okay. And another ruling also is not just that. I mean, the same way also we cannot be cruel to animals as well. And this is also exemplified in other ahadith. For example, narrated by Abdullah bin Jafar, an. فَدَخَلَ حَائِطًا لِرَجُلٍ مِنَ الْأَنصَارِ فَإِذَا جَمَلٌ فَلَمَّا رَأَى النَّبِيَّ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ حَنَّا وَدَرَفَتْ عَيْنَاهُ فَأَتَاهُ النَّبِيُّ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ فَمَسَحَ ذِفْرَاهُ فَسَكَتَ فَقَالْ مَنْ رَبُّ هَذَا الْجَمَلِ لِمَنْ هَذَا الْجَمَلِ فَجَاءَ فَتًى مِنَ الْأَنصَارِ فَقَالْ لِيَا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ فَقَالْ أَفَلَا تَتَّكِ اللَّهَ فِي هَذِهِ الْبَهِيمَ الَّتِي مَلَّكَكَ اللَّهُ إِيَّاهَا فَإِنَّهُ شَكَى إِلَيَّ أَنَّكَ تُجِيعُهُ وَتُدْعِبُهُ He, the Prophet Wasallam, entered the garden of a man from the Ansar, the people of Medina. And all of a sudden there, a camel saw the Prophet Wasallam and started to weep. And it was making a yearning sound, a moaning sound. And its eyes flowed, and the Prophet ﷺ came to it and wiped and stroked the temple of its head so that it could become quiet. And then he said, Who is the master of this camel? Whose camel is this? A young man from the Ansar came and said, This is mine, Messenger Allah. He said, Don't you fear Allah about this beast which Allah has given you in your possession? It is complained to me that you keep it hungry and loaded heavily which fatigues it. And this is narrated in Surah Nabi Dawood and also is Sahih in terms of its grading. So here, subhanAllah, here the Prophet is that you a miracle where the camel comes to the Prophet and complains to it and the Prophet is able to communicate with it and he complained, this camel complained to the Prophet that he was being ill-treated. He was being kept hungry and overloaded with a lot of work. SubhanAllah. And look at how the Prophet commanded the the people of Madi, this person, for example, to have taqwa, to have taqwa of Allah, you have fear of Allah regarding what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to him in his possession. These are all beautified admonitions for us, again, to be merciful to the animals as well. And furthermore, in the late contemporary scholar, Sheikh Abdullah bin Jibreel, okay, he was Saudi scholar, he was also part of the permanent committee for Islamic research for issuing fatwas. He said that based on this hadith, okay, animals should not be used for experiments in the laboratory. And this can only be done, the testing, if they are not going to be harmed. But well, this again shows that Islam is the religion of ihsan and mercy, contrary to the image which is portrayed in the West. Okay. And these hadith again show the high ethical standards of this deen, alhamdulillah. And again, we have to remember also that implicit in the discussion of Ihsan is also that our fellow human beings deserve even more Ihsan than the animals. So, as we're looking at Ihsan for the animal, what about Ihsan to each other? I mean, many times the human beings are treated worse than animals. And it's unfortunate that all around the Muslim Ummah, the Muslims, unfortunately, they're treating each other, other Muslims, as subhuman. Okay, not even... Uh, worse than animals, unfortunately. Okay, this is again the the great degree of decay we've gone to because of our uh, being far away from this deen, unfortunately. Now, turning to the next topic, which is ihsan and jihad. Muslims are commanded to do ihsan and apply ihsan even in jihad when fighting enemies. So, during a war, the elderly, the children, women, and those who are not fighting are not to be harmed in Islam. So even when actively fighting the enemy in war, who is to be killed, Ihsan still has to be applied. So like for example, mutilation, or just torture, these things are not to be done. If you're supposed to kill something, then do it with Ihsan. Brutality and torture, these things are, this is not the way of Islam. Burning, for example, this is not the way. So thus ethics are still to be maintained to prevent unnecessary brutality and injustice. 
And unfortunately, many times people forget this, even in the state of war. Okay. And also, POWs, captives of war, also to be treated with ihsan. And it was Islam also who introduced a new way of dealing with captives. For example, in the Battle of Badr, the Prophet ﷺ released the captives on the condition that they would teach beneficial knowledge to the Muslims. Okay. And today also we have, unfortunately, weapons of mass destruction. Okay. And they unfortunately have been developed and they had been used by the West, for example, in modern warfare. Okay. Using these types of weapons causes so much collateral damage which clearly contradicts the concept of Ahsan. Thus, many scholars say that these things cannot be used in Islam. Okay. However, some contemporary scholars hold the view that Muslims are allowed to use them only in response or in self-defense if those weapons are being used on Muslims. Weapons of mass destruction in general, these are something which are haram, but again, if they're being used against Muslims, then the Muslims can also counter only in this case. So highlights of this beautiful hadith. Well, this hadith highlights the essential principle, fundamental principle of ihsan in Islam, in everything. Okay. From it, we are commanded to uphold the highest standard in our actions, whether they be ibadi actions, you know, ibadah, also in our worldly affairs as well, just being gentle to an animal. You see, an animal which is so thirsty or extremely hungry, as we saw that this person reached into the well and scooped up the water with his shoe and fed the dog, and that erased all his sins and allowed him to enter Jannah, subhanAllah. So even in these actions where we are slaughtering the animal, we are obliged to practice ihsan. Okay. And even in the circumstance or the case of jihad on the battlefield, okay, where there's killing involved, then also the same applies as well. Brutality, injustice, zulm, this is against Islam. If we are obliged to hold the highest standards and minimize any unnecessary suffering or harm, that's the point. That's the point. To do the dabiha, to do the slaughtering, the animal is going to feel pain. We want to minimize it. Sharpen the knife. Okay. Make it quick. Do not scare the animal. Give it some water so that it feels comfortable in its last moments as well. If we're doing the other actions of ihsan in our ibadah, then we also, it should resonate in our other actions as well. And this is again one point of this hadith. Okay. But the obligation of doing ihsan also shatters again the widespread demonization of Islam as a bloodthirsty and violent religion. And it is in fact, of course, the exact opposite. Okay, it's unfortunate that a large percentage of Muslims do not exemplify Ihsan to combat this misconception. The person who practices Ihsan throughout his life is a Muhsin. Allahumma ja'alna min al muhsinin And he or she attains the highest rank among the believers with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it's through this hadith that all Muslims are pushed to aim for the best in their daily living and not be lazy or do actions for the sake of just completing it. Okay, Jazakallah khair for attendance. Again, Allahumma ja'alna min al-muhsineen. With this we'll close. Subhanakallahu alhamdik wa nashadu wa la ilaha illa anta wa sallafu wa tubu wa ilayka assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.